In book 18, Patroclus is dead and Achilles suffers the loss of his friend. Now we saw in book 9 that his wrath was still against Agamemnon and that even Odysseus's offer that Achilles could win great glory by killing Hector does not promise anything for Achilles. It does not sway him to enter the fight. Now we are nine more books in. So if we imagine a three-day festival, we are probably at the end of day two and Achilles' wrath switches. So Achilles' wrath begins the epic. We see it reinstated in book nine and now in book 18, it is turning in a different direction as we close the second day probably of the festival. It is now turning towards Patroclus' killer Hector. Homer describes Achilles' grief this way. A dark cloud enveloped Achilles. Taking with both hands the fire-blackened ashes, he poured them upon his head and defiled his handsome face. But now, Patroclus, since I am following you beneath the earth, I shall not honor you with funeral rites until I lay here the armaments and head of Hector, your slayer, great-hearted one. So he defiles himself with ash, he is in mourning, and he promises his dead friend that this mourning will not just end with him and his death, it will end with the head of Hector and the armaments laid here and then he will bury his friend. This seems uh, an inordinate amount of grief here. People have talked about the way that he defiles himself, that he turns himself into darkness, that he, in a sense, becomes almost death, blackness, darkness, almost a monster with these ashes upon him, destroying his handsome appearance, destroying anything that was godlike about him by defiling himself with these ashes and changing who he is. In the statue here, you have Achilles and his mother and Thetis is actually mourning the loss of her son because she knows that as she has told Achilles his two fates, he can go home to Peleus and the land of his father, back to the Myrmidons and live happily ever after. Or if he fights, he will never go home. And so she is not actually mourning Patroclus as she approaches him and weeps. She's approaching him knowing that this is his death, that he has, in a sense, signed his death sentence. He has chosen his fate, and he will not leave the Trojan War alive. He will die. And so she is losing her son in this moment. So in some sense, we are already foreshadowing the grief to come. Now, in the Iliad, you don't see the death of Achilles, but it is foretold we are really emphasizing his mortality here, that he is making this decision, knowing that he's going to have great chaos, but that doesn't even seem to be on his mind. It's really just about the head of Hector. Um, he doesn't even see what it is doing, destroying his mother and, uh, and causing her, her great concern. He does listen to her. She says, please do not go into battle until I have armor for you. So of course, Hector now has Patroclus's armor, which was actually Achilles' armor, and so Achilles needs great armor. It was considered immortal armor. I'm not sure what made it immortal. It's just called immortal, made by a hand of an immortal. It doesn't save the person and make them immortal, but it is immortal armor. And so he's going to receive immortal armor again. Thetis approaches Hephaestus, who is uh, the blacksmith of the gods, and he is able to make great and beautiful things and he's going to make this shield of Achilles on behalf of Thetis. And so we get to hear this beautiful description of the shield. When I first read this poem, I was 18, and for some reason the description of the shield stood out to me more than any other description in the poem. All the different layers of meaning. In a sense, the artwork of the shield and the way that it depicts different aspects of life becomes a metaphor of the poem itself. It becomes an analogy for the poem. It is, it is art, it's an artifact that records the deeds of men. And through it, you get to question then, what is art, what is its role? How does Hephaestus' depiction of these five different layers show us the five different layers of life within art? What does it say that these, 
these people look lifelike, that they seem to be moving, and yet we know that they're static and remaining the same. In the same way, might we look at Achilles and all the things that we hope for him, that we wish for him, that we hope he would make a different decision in this moment, that he would choose his other fate. And yet we know he's never going to. He will always be Achilles. He will always make this choice in this moment. And the art allows us that interaction with the character while also cognitively we know that nothing can change in the poem itself. And so the shield then becomes that representation of Homer's poem. So let's look for a moment at the shield and how the shield is described uh, before we close our discussion of Book 18. Achilles' shield has five different layers to it. And what you see here is a depiction an actual shield was made, and um, I think it was by Kathleen Vale. You can look up her information online, but the shield was recreated according to the descriptions that are given to us in Book 18 of the Iliad. At the very center of everything is creation. It's described here as the sun and the moon and the heavens. Creation, the starting point of everything, the beginning in the center of the shield. It's the beginning of the story. We can imagine that we have zoomed out to understand Achilles going into war, right? How have been things been made? How have things been faded? The shield is telling you where you fit within a larger story. The next ring is the civil inner life. We have people getting married. We have people cheering. We have things that go on in your normal day to day. Then there's war. This of course is where the Iliad is. If we look at a connection between on one side the Odyssey in some sense is being described here the civil life, and the Iliad is the war life. And then peace, war and peace. Finally, the outside, the fifth layer, therein Hephaestus set the river Oceanus around the rim. The way that people envisioned the world was that it was a flat circle, and thus the ocean was the river that went around the entire world and kept everything within bound. And if you crossed that river, you went into the underworld, essentially. You went into an, another realm and left the realm of this earth. And so the definitions of the shield, the boundary of the shield, are the boundaries given by the gods to this world itself. And so the shield is defined by its boundaries here. And Achilles then would be wise if he would listen to the shield and define himself within the boundaries. But of course, we will not see that happening, that he does not observe the boundaries given by the gods. He does not observe creation his purpose for what he was made. He does not observe civil life, war tradition, or even the goal being eventual peace. His shield in some ways becomes very paradoxical or very ironic from the way he actually is going to act on the battlefield. He's going to become a person of war, not a person of peace.